Good morning, and welcome to worship at Abington Presbyterian Church. We are so happy to have you here, whether you're in person or you're online. We just thank you that you have joined us, and we hope that you feel the spirit and the presence of the Lord as you worship today. I have three announcements that I'd like to lift up this morning. The rest you will find in your bulletin. Uh, make sure you look that over to see what APC is doing and also to know who to contact in case you need more information. First, a word of thanks to our volunteers who worked with Vacation Bible School this past week. The children were exploring the question, who is my neighbor? And it was an enriching, fun week for all involved. Also, thanks to those who have given backpacks filled with school supplies that will go to children in need. We are at a deadline to get those donations in. If you have one or more backpacks today, please leave them outside the church office. As a follow-up to our congregational survey regarding pandemic concerns, you are invited to share your hopes and dreams for what what's next for our congregation. Two opportunities to speak up are upcoming. First, under the tent in person on Sunday morning, August 15th, at 10 a.m. between worship services and childcare will be provided. And the second is on a Zoom meeting, Tuesday, August 17th at 7.30 p.m. The link is in your bulletin materials. Worship, music, and congregational leaders want, you, want to hear from you. If you are able, would you please stand and let's call one another to worship. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion.
You may be seated. God wants us, wants to move us to new heights. Please join me in our responsive prayer of confession based on the 130th Psalm. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all iniquities. God the Creator brings you new life forgives and redeems you. Take hold of this forgiveness and live your life in the spirit of Jesus. In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Celebrating the, the peace that Christ brings, I invite you now to turn to your neighbor and share a sign or word of peace with them. The peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Good morning to all of my friends who are online and those who will watch later. We are glad that you are with us in all of the ways that you have been, online, in person, everything. It's been a wonderful way to share worship. Well, after three years, and did you know it's been three years, we had our first week of Vacation Bible School since 2018. It was really fun. In 2019, you might remember we were building our new elevator, and so the grounds were torn up and we didn't want to be in the way of the construction crew, and so we had evening vacation Bible school for everyone, not just kids, all ages. And then in 2020, well, you know, COVID, so we didn't have anything. And we did a lot of good online summer Sunday school things, but not a specific week of vacation Bible school. So this year was the first time since a long time. And we had a little bit smaller group, 14 kids, four youth, and six wonderful adult volunteers. And it was a wonderful week. We talked about who is my neighbor. 
and we had great crafts every day that helped our bodies and our minds and our spirit all understand everything that we were talking about through the Good Samaritan story and how Jesus taught us to understand who is our neighbor. And we didn't just look at the Samaritan and how he was such a good neighbor to the man who was hurt, but we looked at the other people also in the story and why were they not ready to help the man who was hurt? Were they afraid? Were they worried that they also could be in danger? Were they feeling like maybe they could send more help if they went and got someone and sent them back? We often think of that story as everybody is bad except for the man who got hurt and the man who helped him, but really there's a lot of complicated things and that's true to be a neighbor. Whether it's our next door neighbors, our community neighbors, our neighbors in our city, our neighbors in our area, our neighbors in our state, even the neighbors in our country and the world, our view of who is our neighbor gets bigger and bigger the more we think about what Jesus asks us to do. Love our neighbor as ourself. One of the last things we did in the week was make these wonderful hand uh, flowers. And on each of them, the children and the youth wrote what it means to be a neighbor. This one says, being a neighbor is to help and love and care for everyone, no matter who they are. And that was written by Ruby. Cooper says, opening doors for people is a neighborly thing to do. This one says, when they are gone, you can look over and take care of their house. Isaac shared that neighborly advice. Loving your neighbor, says Asher, all of four and a half, almost five years old. I think he's got it figured out. And my friend Henry says, making people smile makes you a good neighbor. We learned a lot about being neighbors and we learned a lot about what it means to help others. And I hope that we will take that knowledge into our neighbors, our neighborhood, our church, our community, and spread it like wildfire. It's a great thing to know. Let us pray. Dear God, it is not hard to know who our neighbors are in your eyes, but sometimes it's hard to know how to be a good neighbor. Things come up and we feel afraid, we feel busy, we feel like maybe we aren't the ones that should be helping. We're not even sure what we should do at times. But your love helps us to understand that all we need to do to be a good neighbor is treat others just as we hope they will treat us. You are so wise, God. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your grace to help us live lives in you. Amen. I get to put on another hat right now and help lead a song. It's one of my favorite songs. It's called Taste and See. And it talks about how we will experience the wonderful creation and glory of God through so many things. So sing along on the refrain with me and then I will sing the verses in the middle of that.
You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we experience your goodness in many ways. With your help, we seek now to open ourselves to take into ourselves the gift of your word to us for this day. Make our spirits receptive to you and your message. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today comes from the first eight verses of Psalm 34, which is a poetic expression of thanksgiving in reference to what God has done, along with an expression urging the faith community to have confidence in God. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried, and was heard by the Lord, and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. The word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 35, and verses 41 through 51. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it, and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread and will live forever, and the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me for, for a minute. O oh Lord our God, how excellent is thy name above all the earth. We come as a humble servant, calling on your Holy Spirit to use these lips of clay for your glory. Amen. I remember that in the 1990s, after a serious earthquake in California, a friend of mine invited me to come to a women's retreat for a week. The retreat took place at the Pajaro Dunes condos near the beach during April. I had not traveled that much, I didn't have a lot of money, and I had never experienced an earthquake. We both prayed about it and finally concluded that a woman's Christian retreat is just what the doctor ordered. I needed to be in a life-changing, I needed to make a life-changing decision, and I needed to be in a different environment among other Christian women. I invited another friend to accompany me on the trip from Philadelphia to California. She uh, is from Panama, and she's a very strong prayer warrior, 
who loves to testify about Jesus. We boarded the plane together not knowing what to expect once we arrived. When we finally arrived at the Dunes condos, I was so very happy. As we drove through the city, we passed the aftermath of the earthquake. It was a, draw, a jaw-dropping sight to see some highway bridges still in the streets, devastation of buildings and homes destroyed. Yet the cars could navigate to their destinations with little problems. When we finally arrived, we unpacked, we met other women, we participated in a worship service and ate dinner together. One thing that we did was we went around looking at each other's condo and comparing how beautiful they were. All of the women's condos were gorgeous. I mean, the atmosphere was beautiful, the furniture was beautiful, how it was all set up was beautiful, everything was just great. But for some reason, when we got to my condo, or the condo that was assigned to us, it was the most dilapidated condo that I had ever seen in my life. I was so embarrassed to tell my friend that this was our condo, I just couldn't believe it. The beds had lumps in it that went like a valley. Even the king-size bed had a big valley in it. And my friend was a big woman, so she had to have a king-size bed because the only thing left were two twin beds. Little did I know that not only I and my friend were going to be in the condo, but two strangers were going to be in there. And they got there before we did, so of course they claimed the king-size bed and one bunk bed. So we had to clear that up and let them know that my friend had to have a big bed and they could have the twin beds, and I would sleep on the sofa bed. But through that whole night, that whole night, I complained and I fussed with the Lord. I said, you had me bring somebody all the way here from Philadelphia to get into a condo in California that was supposed to be luxurious, and it's the most beat up place I've ever been in my life. And I complained, and I complained. Well, my friend, she got into bed. She went to sleep. At least I thought she did. And then about maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, she woke up, and I heard the shuffling into the, into the area that would have been the living room. And she says, Jed, the Lord have a word for you. I was like, uh-oh. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. I said, the Lord has a word for me? He, she said, yes. I said, well, what is it? She said, the Lord said he did not send you here to be comfortable. He sent you here to, com to comfort the people. You are here to comfort the people. And remember that. And then she shuffled back into the bed and went back to sleep. And I sat up and I was like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. You told me I wanted to come and relax. And I wanted you to minister to me. But you're sending me here to minister to people. So I, I better get my act together. So that next morning, I got up and I went to the beach. And there was nobody on the beach. I mean, for miles, there was nobody on the beach but me. And I sat down on the sand, and I looked over the horizon, and I could see the sky, and then the, the, the ocean, and then the sand or the beach. And it sort of all blended together, and it was just gorgeous. It was just gorgeous. And, and, and God let me know that he had created all of those things, not only those things, but he had created me. And that he had a purpose for all, all of these things. And as I looked out, I felt a peace come over me. And I felt a presence which reminded me that even though I could not see any other human being on that beach, I was not alone. I began to think about how God had created us to bless and glorify God. The horizon, horizon was magnificent with the sunrise, the skyline, the ocean, all blending with the beach. Yellow, blue, blue-green, and sand colors all blended together. My response was to begin to praise God for all that he had accomplished within a day's travel. I could not contain my praise. In that moment, I was reminded of God's awesomeness and his goodness and his love. In that moment, I began to cry out to the Lord to help me and to forgive me for complaining and to restore my soul, which needed peace and rest. 
My song was the same as David's. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will continually be in my mouth. The pericope for Psalm 34 is a praise response to how good God has been to us and a reminder of how God responds to us or responds to his people when they need God's help. This psalm was written by David, a humble servant and a talented musician. David was running for his life and hiding from Saul. Saul was threatening David's life because of his popularity, the fact that he had killed the Philistine giant and that people were loving him more and more, more than they loved Saul. Saul became insanely jealous of David. It is believed that while David was hiding in the cave called Adela, he wrote this eloquent acrostic song. This praise song used all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph to Ta. David loved to praise with his musical instrument. No matter what struggles he was going through, in the present time, he gave God the glory. I will bless the Lord, he said, at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Then when the word bless was used, it meant that the posture, the prayer posture, would be uh, on his knees, which was a sign of perpetual blessing to the Lord. David had experienced the steadfast love and mercy of God throughout his life. As we read this poem or this psalm, we are invited to join with David when he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. David realizes that everyone doesn't have that experience, that death and that breath of God's love. He invites his humble readers to listen to a testimony which they can relate to that has to do with human conditions. The humble or the weak and the poor, the afflicted. We all go through times in our life when we need God's mercy and grace. The humble hear a boast not a boast in themselves, not a boast in another human being. They hear the soul boasting in the Lord and all and are glad. They cry to magnify the Lord. Excuse me. This cry to magnify the Lord caused those who are humble, the, those who are ashamed, the distressed, the persecuted, the unhappy, and the vulnerable to join in. The testimony of one poor soul encourages another and invites them to celebrate. The report of deliverance calls for celebration and gratefulness. It calls for thanksgiving and praise. It calls for exaltation and glory to God. One might ask the question, well, how does God bless humans? God gives us a gift of provision. He gives us a reasonable activity of our mind and of our limbs. He strengthens us to get up in the morning and to do our work. He gives us compassion during times of struggle peace during times of grief, forgiveness, mercy, joy, and love. These are just a few gifts. I'm sure that you can think of many more gifts. What we can give God that is not, what, what, what is it that we can give God that he, he doesn't already have? How, how can we bless or how can we boast? How can our soul boast in the Lord? When we boast in the Lord, we acknowledge God as our strength, especially when we rejoice in the Lord. This boasting is not just for the individual and the Lord. The psalmist hopes that all who hear his song, especially the humble, will join in the singing and the praising of God. How do you bless the Lord? Maybe you're not a songwriter, and, and maybe you don't have other gifts like painting or you do have other gifts like painting and gardening and dancing or singing, and maybe you have photography as a gift. Maybe you uh, meet new people and make new friends. Maybe you know how to encourage people, and maybe you're a counselor to those who are less fortunate than you. Whatever way you choose to glorify God is a way of praising. We have a promise in this psalm that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Fear meaning reverence, fear meaning honor, and the angel of the Lord will deliver them. Oh, taste and see for yourselves that the Lord is good. 
Experience it for yourselves, the goodness of the Lord. Let us remind ourselves how many times God has walked alongside us in a situation in which we eventually found peace. Speaking of tasting, in John 6, 35 and 41 through 51, Jesus said to those who were following him after the miracle of feeding the 5,000 with five barley loaves and two fish, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus knew that the crowds were following him because he satisfied their physical need for food. They were full from his meal and could have cared less about his healings and his teachings. Jesus gave them good counsel, though. He said, don't work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him his, has God the Father placed his seal of approval. Bread has been a staple since the early biblical days. I did just a little teeny bit of research on bread. I didn't have a whole lot of time. So, you know, my kids always say, go to Google if you want to find out something. So I checked out Google to find about the biblical breads. And they had a couple breads there. Of course, I couldn't pronounce one of them. I went through the whole Google thing. Couldn't figure out how to pronounce it. But maybe some of you know how. It's called Yuga, U-G-A-H. Then I was like, maybe it's Uga. And I said, maybe it's Uggs. I don't know. But anyway, that was one of the breads. Then another one was called Kikar. And both of those are flat breads. Then there was one called Rakik or Rakik. It's a thin wafer. And then a hala, which was a thicker loaf in which the best quality of flour was used. I recognized the hala. The hala bread was the best. It's that bread, you know, that comes in rolls tied together and it's sweet and good. And, put a little butter on it, it's just wonderful. The holla bread, I knew what that was. So the people during those times were used to good nutritious bread. This is back in the biblical days, was satisfying the physical body. But it wasn't until the New Testament that the bread for the soul was instituted at the Last Supper as the body of Christ. The body of Christ satisfied the spiritual appetite for the soul. Now, I did a little bit on nutrition, not that much. I'm not a nurse or a doctor. And if it gets too deep, I can't, my brains can't handle it, you know. But I know that it's good to have good nutrition so that you're healthy and that you can, you know, have stamina and energy and think good and run fast. In case you're doing that fast run, you got to have good nutrition. So I, I looked up a little bit. It said, the World Health Organization defines proper nutrition as an adequate, well-balanced diet combined with regular physical activity, and that poor nutrition can lead to reduced immunity, increased susceptibility to disease, impaired physical and mental development, and reduced product, product, productivity. Some breads are more nutritious than others. The breads considered the most nutritious in today's market are these. Some of them you may recognize, and some of them I'm not too sure of. The first one was Ezekiel bread. Now, I looked up Ezekiel bread, and I, I wasn't sure if the Ezekiel bread was like a name brand like Pepperidge Farm, or if the Ezekiel bread was a real bread that they mixed together and it was special. But anyway, Ezekiel bread was listed. Then flaxseed bread. I know flaxseed is good for you, but I never had any flaxseed bread. Rye bread, oat bread, oatmeal bread, whole wheat bread, and whole grain bread. There's a lot to learn about nutritious bread. Because of allergies, when selecting bread, we should always look for certain things. Is it gluten-free? Is it sugar-free? And is it non-GMO? Don't ask me what that all means. I'm not too sure. I just know the doctor told me that if I wanted to lose weight, I needed to cut out the bread. And as soon as he said that, I wanted to run to the fast, the, the quickest, fastest, closest 
uh, bakery that I could find and buy up every bread on the loaf, or I mean on the shelf. So, you know, doctors shouldn't tell people don't eat any bread. They should just say eat bread moderately and look for certain things for nutrition. None of these breads that I mentioned, though, none of them are manna, none of them are living bread, and none of them are breads from heaven. None of them. These are all nutritious, but the question remains, what is the most nutritious bread? Jesus lets us know that the most spiritually nutritious bread is the bread from heaven. But they were confused when Jesus said he was the bread of life. They began to ask how to work the works of God. And Jesus said to them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he has sent. They wanted to see signs to believe. They believe that in the wilderness of Egypt, Moses fed them manna from heaven, and he showed them a sign. But Jesus said, no, Moses didn't send you a sign. That was God. That was my father that sent you the sign. So he, he declared again that he was the bread from heaven. So there were two problems that developed. One was, how could this Jesus be uh, a bread from heaven when he had a human being for human beings as parents? And secondly, he said, the only way that you can know all that I'm trying to tell you is because God will draw you and God will teach you. And so why does God draw? What do they mean? What has what meant God dr draws you? They didn't understand that at all. But we have some church fathers, you know, from the early days that taught us about the drawing power of God. And it says, and Augustine was one of them, and he said, the drawing power of God's grace as enabling the inner palate of the soul. You see, the soul sometimes gets hungry, so it's, it's a pal it has a palate, to, and, it, and it tries to find the greatest pleasure and delight in partaking, partaking the truth. Calvin wrote, the manner of drawing is not violent. Like God or the Holy Spirit will never knock you upside the head in order for you to understand that God or Jesus is the bread of heaven. It, 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 he's not violent. The Holy Spirit is kind and he's peaceful. So it says, Calvin said, the manner of drawing is not violent so as to compel us by external force. But yet it is an effectual moment, movement of the Holy Spirit, turning us from unwilling and reluctant into willing. Your ancestors, Jesus said, ate the manna from heaven and they died. Verily I tell you, I am the bread of life. Here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Verily I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand and let us say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, by the Holy, Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We continue to worship and praise you for being God all by yourself. There are no other gods before you. We address you with the name I am, in Hebrew, Emi Ego. You are the living bread, the bread that came down from heaven. You are the bread that gives eternal spiritual nour nourishment. You are the bread who sustains us and gives us life. You are the most nutritious bread. 
All the nutrients that we need are in you. You empower us spiritually to live and to do the will of the Father. You give us grace to increase our faith and to believe that God loves us. Grace to go through the trials of grief, sadness, persecution, hunger, financial lack, discrimination, and injustice. Through it all, you walk alongside us to bring us out. Every day you are working out our good and our victorious end. When we, wait, when we taste and see, we get to know and love you more. Thank you for the privilege to praise you, to glorify your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege of crying out to him, knowing that he will answer in his time. Most of all, thank you that one day we will be in your presence for all eternity. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God has provided richly for us and calls upon us to share what has been placed within our care. You will find an offering plate where you exit. You can use the QR code on the back of the bulletin to be taken to the donation page of our church website or you can mail in your tithes and offerings, <clears throat> all of which strengthen Christ's ministry through this congregation. Thank you.
So my prayer for us today is that God would fill us to fullness of his spiritual bread, the bread from heaven. And may the grace of God and the love, uh, may the grace of God, the grace of Jesus. May you be blessed this day with love, grace, and fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. again. God bless you. And may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you now and forever. Amen.